Hi, I'm Allison Stewart from WNYC. All of it, this is kind of a fun thing for us. It's a Brooklyn Book Festival, our book club Get Lit with All of It mashup because our authors today, Gary was our very first author for 2022. Uh, <laughs> and A.M. Holmes is our author this month. So this is exciting. Um, you would, will you be embarrassed if I read your bios? Or should I just, we just go best? We can do that thing where we do, right? You know, we do Ready? Yeah. Okay, stick your fingers in your, fingers so in yours. Gary Steingart's debut novel was the Russian debutante's handbook, followed by Absurdist, Absurdistan, which was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. You know his other work, Super Sad True Love Story, and of course his memoir, Little Failure, was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. His books have been published in 30 countries. His most recent novel is Our Country Friends. Welcome, Gary Steingart. And, yes, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Thank you. I was expecting that. Thank you. I'm here for you. A.M. Holmes is the author of 13 books, among them the best-selling memoir, The Mistress's Daughter, as well as the novels This Book Will Save Your Life, The End of Alice and Jack, and the short story collection Days of Awe, The Safety of Objects, and Things You Should Know. She also writes for film and TV and teaches creative writing program at Princeton University. Her latest novel is The Unfolding. Welcome to A.M. So if you, you've probably all read the setup, that the title of this is Sick and Satired, um, which is pretty funny. Uh, the blurb describes what your books are about, but I want to, to know from each of you, when someone asks you, Gary, what is our country friends about? What do you say? Oh, hi everyone. <laughs> That's not what I say. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Is this right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just say it's a novel about friendship. And then, if that's not enough for my interlocutor, like a lot of stuff's about friendship, Gary, uh, then I say, it also has COVID in it. And then they back away from me and don't buy the book. So, uh, so in other words, I don't have a good elevator pitch, mm -hmm. but it is about uh, friends um, kind of uh, living in a country house upstate. Um, I mostly live upstate now. I, I just come down here to see you nice folks. Um, and um, so it's a novel about that. Uh, and all these friends who have known each other for a long time get together and betray each other. So <laughs> as I described it to my editor, it's like Chekhov meets the big chill, mm -hmm. which for a lot of younger people is like, what? <laughs> but, and I grew up, big chill was a big, mm -hmm. uh, was a big movie for me because it had a lot of the stars of the era. So, uh, yeah. There you go. Am when people say, what is your book about? It's like Chekhov and Big Chill. Um, <laughs> that's a, that is actually the perfect, that's even like, it's what's smaller than an elevator pitch. Right. Is it like the parking lot? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my book, I don't know, um, it is, well, I was worried. <laughs> I felt like there was something happening in this country that, that in a weird way, people weren't quite noticing. And I, it, it had to do with, the larger political establishment kind of losing touch with the average American, and then this influx of what we now call dark money, which used to be like $10,000, $100,000. It, no joke, has escalated to $1.8 billion by a single donor um, into our political process. So I wanted to sort of look at the American political system and also to weave that with a story, a domestic and intimate story about a family and kind of people both waking up to the world around them, and I guess a lot of what I perceived as um, the exponential expression of racism and sexism following Obama's election. And I believe it's still exponentially, like one of those things that just keeps going like that, so. So Gary, as you mentioned, you live upstate, but you are obviously well acquainted with New York City. Oh yeah. Uh, you, so you saw all those New Yorkers flood to the Hudson Valley. Yeah. Like Kingston became Brooklyn North. Oh God, yeah. Um, what uh, did you observe about that exodus <laughs> that you thought, I really want to incorporate in this book and that you could right. find satire in? Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating. All of a sudden, half of Brooklyn moved upstate. And I was at the DMV trying to, in Kingston trying to get my license renewed. And this woman came out with a bullhorn and was like, if you're from Brooklyn, go home. <laughs> we don't want you. And it, it just, it felt, I, I lived in Brooklyn for years. It felt very painful, but also kind of cool. Because I was like, <laughs> my license says, you know, my little town upstate. So that was very nice. Uh, but others of us were very confounded by nature. Um, a friend of mine called the police because he thought the property next door that somebody was killing someone else 
and the officer said, could you hold up your phone to the screaming? And he did, and the officer said, uh, well, that's an owl. <laughs> and then he said, you just moved up here, didn't you? From Brooklyn, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's an interesting kind of uh, resettlement, I would say, uh, to the locals as more of a conquest type of scenario mm -hmm. where uh, wonderful folks from, from this borough are moving up and trying to reinvent themselves in this kind of, it's rural, but it's also not because the same chefs that you have in Brooklyn have now moved up there and are slinging, you know, Korean, Filipino, Fusion pancakes. Pancakes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so all of the stuff that we have here is now there, uh, except we are surrounded by people who often, let's say, do not share our political proclivities and would uh, feel more at home in A.M. Holmes's time. <laughs> right? yeah. To satirize something, you need to know about it. So yeah. you've been fortunate because you were there prior to the, the exodus, so you had a good sense of of what it was like there. Am, you're from Chevy Chase, Maryland. You went to college in Washington, D.C. What was something you observed about the way people in D.C. behave that you were able to use in this book? Well, so I, I grew up basically in D.C. So my, mm -hmm. my whole childhood, was, you know, when we were little, you would go and they would just take you to the White House and like Nixon and Pompidou would be speaking and you would just do cartwheels on the lawn. Cause it was like, it meant, it was, I didn't know that Washington DC was not just a small weird dysfunctional southern town until Nixon resigned and I was at camp in North Carolina and then the counselors were crying and saying they bet their mamas were having heart attacks I was like I think there's a party somewhere you know and then I also thought I'm really at the wrong camp like a Jewish kid in a Christian camp in like deep North Carolina which is a whole other thing so I think it was that beginning to realize that Washington sort of both both how in a way how super small and individual and fallible and also it's a, it, there is a game to politics. You know, when I was younger, we got new classmates all the time and then it turned out everyone just wanted to live in DC. And so there were all these think tanks and lobbying and just more khakis were made and everyone stayed. <laughs> so it very much from the inside. And then also just the weird thing, like as a kid, I'm like, mom, do you remember there used to be a warplane parked over there in the park? And she's like, yes, I do. And we're thinking, why was there a warplane park behind the trees in Rock Creek Park? Like, there's just a strange absurdity to things there that everyone just takes for granted. Yeah. I want to talk about your protagonist a little bit, and then I'll get you both yeah. to read. So Senderovsky is your protagonist, Gary. It's his place upstate where he's inviting all of these friends who were, there's all sorts of shenanigans ensue. Um, we want to root for him, but as my producer Jordan, we were talking about it, we also kind of laugh at him, or maybe with him, we're supposed to. Yeah. Um, why did you invite us to laugh either at or with your yeah, protagonist? Yeah, you know, the, the line between at and with uh, for someone who writes comical fiction has always been very strange. Uh, are they laughing at you or with you? I started writing, in English at least, because I was sent to a... Um, I was sentenced to eight years of a Hebrew school for a crime I did not commit, but uh, <laughs> in Queens, a yeshiva, and um, there the kids hated me because it was the, you know, the Soviet Union had just disintegrated, and, or, or was it, no, I was still going strong, Brezhnev, and um, I had this big fur hat, the whole thing, I couldn't speak no English, uh, and so I decided to make friends, I would write uh, a version of the Torah called the Gonorrah. Um, Exodus became Sexodus. I mean, you know, it was very horny stuff. And then um, that's how I made my first friends. Hmm. And that was sort of for me the difference between la being laughed at and being laughed with because we all hated these rabbis and all this stuff. So this was a way for us to get our anger out. Um, but in this book, I kind of see Sendorovich, Sendorovsky as a kind of comical character in the context that he has all these friends coming up and some of them are less comical than him. Uh, but in essence, I, I kind of want to poke fun at the whole idea of friendship, um, what we're supposed to mean to one another, especially for characters whose parents have not been good parents. Um, that's sort of the, the, the milieu in which I come from. Some of my best friends are also immigrant uh, kids who grew up with very tough immigrants whose parents would tell them things like, <laughs> I remember a good friend of mine who immigrated from Bombay and his father would always say, Son, no one will ever love you because you have very low muscle tone. <laughs> so you must become an engineer. I don't know how those two things work, but uh, he's made a career out of it. You know, mm -hmm. not engineering, writing about his awful parents. 
so that kind of stuff, uh, uh, the idea of having a group of, of people who are now in my generation, so not so young no more, uh, but uh, concentrating on their friendship and not just their relationship to, their, to the previous generation. Your protagonist uh, in the unfolding is the big guy. He is the big guy. He is so distressed that Obama has been elected president that he is going to do something. And we follow him as he tries to do something. Um, how did you arrive on the big guy? We never know his, his first name. We know his last name, but not his first name. Because I think he's one of many big guys. You know, I think we all see and experience the big guy at various times. Um, I have a strange almost habit of sometimes picking the least likely character to talk about something. And I also felt that, you know, when we look at, um, I guess I, I'm always very invested in, in taking on points of view and, and experiences that are very different than my own. I, as much as like, you know, I was like, write what you know, write what's yours, and I think I would have run out like so long ago. Um, and so I wanted to also understand more about how someone like the big guy experiences the world, how they move through the world. Um, and I think what Gary's saying too, it's always interesting because I get in trouble too in that sense of are you making fun of something or are you also sort of enjoying the thing or celebrating it? And I think it is, it's a complicated toggle. But I also feel like it's super important to make people laugh because then I think I can also be all the more serious. And all of these things are ultimately really serious. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I teach. Mm -hmm. I love. I love what you said. I teach a class at, at Columbia about um, um, humorous writing, and, and my whole point is that the humor is your intercontinental ballistic missile. It's the payload is tragedy. Yeah. Right. So what you're trying to get across is tragedy, but humor is the easiest way to get that thing across and you know kill billions with it. Yeah. Uh, before I ask you to read, you know, like, to your point, your reader, you are because you're both skilled at this, we really get a sense of a whole bunch of different points of view, even though you have protagonists. There's a lot of different people populating your novel. And when you went back and you were reading and going through edits, aside from your protagonist, was there another character whose POV you needed in this book or else it wouldn't work? Really need it, you realize that? Well, I think I, there's eight characters in this, including a, a, a young woman who's young woman. She's eight years old. Uh, who? Uh, so what I've done with this book, what I kind of liked from previous books, is that you know, Senderowski kind of is the protagonist, but I try to, even within the span of a sentence or a paragraph, to switch perspective from one character to another. So, so that really the eight of them become like one giant eight tentacled, eight tentacled organism, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, and, and, and there's a mysterious narrator uh, who is, I guess, God. Yeah. How about for um, you? I have no God. No, I, I, um, <laughs> Godless. I, yeah, I feel like there's, it, it's interesting. For me, I don't even, although the big guy is in a way sort of the dominant because he is mm -hmm. the big guy, uh, there, there are other very key figures, uh, his wife Charlotte and his daughter Megan. And I also was trying to really illustrate sort of, I don't know, the state of the nation with regard to where we are with men and women, where we are with mm -hmm. women's lives in a multi-generational sense. Um, and it was super important, I think, in terms of if there was one character that I could not have not had, it is the character of Megan, because it really is this braid of a novel with the sort of large-scale political, sociological view, and then this intimate domestic view of a girl voting for the first time that year and beginning to wake up to the idea of, oh, how do I see myself in relation to my family? Which is obviously a universal. We all have these moments where you individuate and separate, and it starts with nursery school, and then we keep doing it. Um, and so Megan to me, you know, we can look at the big guy, we can look at all of what's happened in this country, and Megan to me is also important because she's Hope. I could have named her Hope, but that would seem like yeah. <laughs> not funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we get you to, each of you to read a little bit from your books? Sure. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Anne? I'll go. Go. I have, I have, I have a special oh. version. Okay. Oh. Oh. Which is, you know, large type and, oh. uh, <laughs> and slightly pre-edited. So I'm just going to read a little bit, and this is really just from the very beginning. Um, so, i.e., it won't make sense, it won't seem that funny, and you'll wonder, where is everyone else? But, so this, the very beginning is um, the night of the Obama-McCain election, um, and that we're in Phoenix, Arizona. Biltmore Hotel, second floor bar, Phoenix, Arizona, 1 a.m. This can't happen here. He's been at the bar for 90 minutes. A dozen men have come and gone, having drowned their sorrows, done a little business, and put the whole thing to bed. There are four whiskey glasses in front of him, each one different, none of them empty. 
In one corner, the television is on, volume down. The talking head post-mortem will go all night. In the other corner by the window, there's a couple canoodling like there's no tomorrow. And in the middle of the bar, a screwball with a Zippo lighter runs his thumb over the wheel again and again, scratching the flint to spark. Windproof, he says each time the fuel ignites. Windproof. It's on me as much as anyone, the big guy says to the bartender. Humility, if nothing else, requires that a man take responsibility for his failures. You sound like a man pleading guilty, the bartender says. The big guy shakes his head. All men make mistakes, but making the same mistake twice is not a mistake. It's a pattern. Tonight it was like fat man and little boy got back together again and planted a mushroom garden right here in Phoenix. And yet somehow we're surrounded by folks who have no idea what they've brought upon themselves. No idea. A man slides in next to the big guy and glances at the four glasses, signals the bartender. Pour me one of those, he says. Which one? The one in the middle. There is no middle, the bartender says. Highland Park, the man says. The big guy looks up. You can call it in the dark. Solanche, the man says, knocking back the drink. You're not one of them, are you? The big guy asks. One of what? Well, your hair is wet, so I'm thinking you're one of the assholes who got sprayed with champagne and did a little victory dance a couple of minutes ago. I don't think so, the man says. I'm more like a fellow who came downstairs and took a dip in the pool in order to clear my head. Explains the smell, the big guy says. Chlorine. The man taps his glass for the bartender. Again, were you in the room upstairs? I was. And what did you see, the big guy asks. A generational earthquake that split the ter terra firma, the man says. I'd characterize it as a heavy metal Led Zeppelin, a grim shaking of the head, the palsied, all too knowing dip of disappointment, keening women knowing they'll have crushed male egos to deal with for breakfast, the damp, dull face of defeat. They banked on the wrong horse in the absence of a better horse, while full well knowing it's not even a horse race, but really a rat race. Please God, tell me you're not a reporter. Historian, sometimes professor, occasional author, but not on the clock tonight. <laughs> Thank you, that was so good. Uh, I'll read from the top, I guess, uh, uh, of our country friends. Uh, the house on the hill was in a tizzy, so already I'm ripping off uh, Anna Karenina, right? Uh, everything was topsy-turvy in the house of Oblomo, so good writers steal. We don't even borrow. <laughs> the house on the hill was in a tizzy. Workman's trucks streamed up the long gravel driveway. Two sets of plumbers from both sides of the river had been summoned to dewinterize the five bungalows behind the main house, and they did not care for one another. A broken set of windows in one bungalow had to be replaced post haste, and a field of mice had chewed through the electrical powering another. The handyman who did not live on the property was so overwhelmed by the state of affairs, he retreated to the extensive covered porch to eat a cheese sandwich in long, deliberative bites. The mistress of the house, Masha, had lowered the shades in her first floor office to escape the cacophony of modern tools and loud country cursing. At times, she would peek out to note the surfaces that would have to be wiped down after the workmen left. COVID, yeah, remember the first COVID? Yes. We were like, gotta wipe it down. <laughs> little did we know, yeah, little did we know, it was completely useless, right? <laughs> <sighs> Natasha, who liked to go by Nat, her eight-year-old daughter was upstairs, illuminated by a screen in the darkness of her room in a lonely public world of her own. Uh, the Korean pop band BTS plays a huge role in this novel, more than in any other novel before it. <laughs> but not, I mean, in the future, more BTS novels will be made. The only happy member of the household was Alexander Borisovich Sindorovsky known as Sasha to his friends. Happy, we should say, with an asterisk. He was agitated as well as excited. A windstorm had brought down the heavy branches of two dead trees flanking the driveway, scattering the vast front lawn with their dead white rot. Sindorovsky liked to expound at length upon the entropic nature of his estate, the way all manner of growth was allowed to go its own way, sumacs elbowing out more well-heeled plants, ivy poisoning the perimeter, groundhogs bringing destruction upon the gardens. A character uh, named Steve the Groundhog plays a very big part in this too, secondary to BTS. Uh, but the scattering of dead tree limbs made the house on the hill look apocalyptic, the very thing Sendorovsky's guests were coming up to escape. The handyman claimed a bad back and was not 
handy enough to remove all the trees on his own. So the so-called tree guy was called in, but he had gone missing. Sindorovsky in his athletic pants and wildly colored dressing gown had tried to move one of these prehistoric branches himself, but the very first heave made him fear a hernia. Ah, the hell with it, he said, and got into his car. A word about the car. Well, okay, not so much about the car as the way in which it was driven. Sendorovsky had only learned to drive three years ago at the milestone age of 45, and only within the limits of a country setting. The highway on the other side of the river unsettled him. He was a fiercely awful driver. The half-empty local roads inspired him to gun, quote unquote, the engine of his sturdy but inflexible Swedish automobile, and he saw the yellow stripes bisecting the road as suggestions meant for less experienced drivers, whoever that might be. Because he did not believe in road marks or certain aspects of relativity, the concept of a blind curve continued to elude him. His wife no longer allowed him to drive with their child on board, and what was worse, he had somewhere picked up the phrase, tooling around. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. so, so a big part of satire is exaggeration. Yeah. What's a scene in the book that you think really, you, you really incorporated exaggeration well? You wanna go first, Gary? That's, uh, I don't think any of this was exaggerated. <laughs> I am a fiercely awful, awful driver. driver. <laughs> uh, I have a car, uh, I bought it for the safety, and it stops whenever I'm about to hit someone. Mm -hmm. Car, person, deer, et cetera. The, the Volvo, Volvo exactly. yeah. It's very good. We bought it before all this technology was coming online where it keeps going, you know, and then it flashes a coffee cup and says, driver alert, please pull over uh, and wow. rest or something. And that's just me getting into the car. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's a, what happens in the book? Uh, yeah, it all kind of happens. Uh, there's an actor in the book and everyone keeps asking me, who is this actor? You know, and they always get it wrong. You can ask me later. Um, but uh, his behavior is slightly it's based on all the actors I've worked mm -hmm. with in, in, in TV and stuff. Uh, his behavior is slightly exaggerated because he's a complete schmuck, but slightly. Yeah. You know, it's 80% <laughs> schmuck and then 20% make believe. Where's, where, where were you able to use exaggeration? It's interesting. So I think, I think it's always a, a balance because you're trying to, on the one hand, I always describe it as like, the super saturation of like a, an overly colored photograph. So w as though, and now people can do this on their phones, but when you, you know, heighten the, the tonalities of things. And then there, for me, with this book in particular, this group of men who are in it, the big guy in his cohort that he calls the forever men, I was trying because reality was getting so weird. I kept pushing them further and further out. And I was like, okay, you know, slightly surrealist, surrealistic. Okay, a little bit like Dr. Strangelovey. And then there's, there is a scene which I would say, for me, suffices with super extreme, <laughs> like, you know, where they go on a hunt club, like, boys weekend um, and they encounter a group of private military contractors who've been hired to sort of basically sort of play war with them in some way. That, that was pretty mm -hmm. exaggerated. Um, and yet, you can hire private military contractors, military contractors anytime you want in this country. I, you know, I, mean, I was thinking, like, that to me doesn't even sound that exaggerated. I when I was writing Lake Success, I had to interview all, and hang out with all these billionaires uh, and that stuff would have been, I remember at one point we took a private jet to Uruguay, we got off, there were all these helicopters waiting, one per person. Yeah, so we you got, don't want to like put anyone at risk. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. But also they all, they knew that I'd written something for Succession, so they had, they wanted all the helicopters to fly in line and then pipe in the music from Succession. Oh, wow. <laughs> then we landed on a yacht yeah. and we got out, off the helicopters and the yacht sailed to this place where these Sea lions had been trained to give us high fives. <laughs> Usually they're like murderous. Yeah. Uh, so it, th this made me think like anything we think is exaggerated right. is happening somewhere, but even worse. But I think that that, no, I, so mm -hmm. I actually think that that is hugely true, despite the fact that I'm wondering if you're microdosing too much, but it's okay. We'll talk later. <laughs> I'm no. microdosing, but I don't know about too much. No. But I think that what you're saying is honestly a really important, for me, thing, because so I have always sort of been this writer who kind of pushes it, I would describe it as like, the, you know, so the, the edges of the plausible emotionally and, and culturally and all of these different things, and yet our world is just blossoming, blossom, what I can't speak today, so exciting, but with, with extreme behavior, with excess, with all of these things that I will say as a fiction writer, it's sort of terrifying. 
because you think, like, it, for one example, I think, oh, I'm a really good catastrophic thinker. I'm like, not anymore, <laughs> you know, because it, it, it's like you wake up and it's, I feel like I've been rubbernecking America. I'm like, what happened now? <laughs> you know, it's just terrible. You do now? Yeah. I know. So I think that's interesting to think about. And it's, I will say with my students, I see a lot of students now absolutely wanting to write speculative fiction, science fiction, any other fiction, because they're like, I don't know what is happening here on Earth, but I can't be here. <laughs> And they're like, you know, and then it's like, the witch said hello to them, whatever. Anyway, it's a whole other thing. But I was wondering, because I was going to ask you, actually yeah. answered my next question, because I was going to ask about parody. I can remember, like, turning on Saturday Night Live to see Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump, and they didn't even rewrite it. Right. He just said what he said, yeah. right? So what he said. Yeah. yeah. Is, it, is it difficult? You kind of answered it. It's difficult to write parody these days, it sounds like. I think it's confusing in some way, because, you know, it, I mean, you know, on the one hand, we can laugh about all these things, but then you look at it and you think, what's happening isn't funny. No. Mm. And then trying to deal with it in a way that both helps us understand it or comprehend it, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out where the, where the humor edge is and also where the behavioral edge is, you know? Um, yeah, we always, it's funny because you always sit around the house and go like, I got a good one for Saturday Night Live, and you're like, you know, and all of a sudden it's just turn on the evening news, and I'm like, oh, it's Saturday Night Live on early, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a few more questions, and then I'm going to leave about 10 minutes for audience questions, so um, get ready. Uh, there's a lot of party scenes in your book on the unfolding. People are at lecture night party, there's a Thanksgiving party, there's a New Year's Eve party. Mm -hmm. What did you want to explore about the way people interact and negotiate social situations. That's so funny, like I never go to parties, I hate parties, I'm the most shy, like introverted person. I didn't even notice there were parties. I think it, it's true. Um, I think it's funny, and somewhat, you know, the idea too, that I think it's in part about um, consumption, about privilege. I, I mean, they have, they have the freedom and ability to go to these parties, but they're also, it's tribal. They show up and hang out with people like them. And I think that there's a lot of need for people, I mean, you know, again, I'm a weirdo. I'm like, I don't know, I'm just home by myself. Um, mm -hmm. But to to be with people who confirm what they believe and how they move through the world, and I think people need to be validated by others. It's something I, I'm working towards. I mean, I, I guess I need to be validated. I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. But there's some weird part of me that goes, I just don't understand that, which makes me not good at parties. Because I'm like, I'm in the corner. I'm like, these are just my crudite. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I, I loved in your book, and it is a little bit exaggerated, but not that exaggerated, because I know you've seen it, the way people act around famous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sane, normal, erudite people lose their minds yeah, around no, famous it's, people. It's true, it's true. I think it's in part because uh, in America we don't have royalty uh, officially, uh, so you know, I always pity the UK for this because they do and they have to, it entails its own problems, especially when queens die. Mm -hmm. um, but in America, I think that, uh, for some reason we've nominated our actors because I guess the dream factory of Hollywood is sort of our, our, our biggest contribution to humanity at this point. Uh, we've nominated them to be our sort of royalty. So whenever I hung out, hang out with, with actors and I've, I've had to spend a lot of time with them, there's always this sort of, it's like they've crossed into a different, I'm walking with them, but they're exuding light mm -hmm. and, and holy <laughs> energy maybe. I'm not going to mention Ben Stiller by name, but you know I was with him once in, in, in LA, and we were doing a project together. And he's a really nice guy, but uh, I'm like Ben. I'm really hungry. Uh, I have low blood sugar. Uh, and I said, you know, there's an In-N-Out, my favorite burger, down the street. Mm -hmm. Let's just go get it. And he was like, sure. So we walk down there, and then we walk in, and you know everything stops. And it was like, and then the owner runs out, and he's crying. He's like, take, take, take whatever you want. Take my. My daughter, take my daughter. <laughs> I have never been so honored, you know. And I realized that that cuts both ways. It's probably strange to be him, like mm -hmm. in, a, in, an, in an out, you know, because one of the things I love about being a writer is, you know, sometimes somebody recognizes me, and, but for the most part, I go incognito wherever I go, and that's wonderful. That's how you notice the world, and that's why you yes. can write about it. Yes. But, if you're someone like that, then the world it becomes a very strange world, I think, which is why so many actors are now doing the meta thing of playing actors, playing actors, et cetera, et cetera, because that's the, the role that they're born to play, so to speak. So when I was writing this actor, I kept thinking both with fondness and sometimes with sympathy about the actors I've known whose lives are no longer kind of theirs in a way. Yeah. And what did you think 
when you saw, with relation to your novel, the January 6th insurrection? <laughs> because well, it yeah. seems like when you're reading the book, let's say your book had yeah. come out six months earlier. Yeah. Okay. You it wouldn't have thought like, oh, this is what the big guy had planted the seeds for. Yeah, I knew that. Um, y yes, I mean, so the book, I was hoping the book would come out before, the, you know, the last election. And, you know, publishing, it turns out, you have to turn it in like a year before it comes out. I'm like, but things are changing. Um, and so I was really lamenting, oh my God, I've missed the window. I've all the things that I've written about, or, you know, it's gonna be too late. And then January 6th happened, and I got like three phone calls, you know, from people who'd read already, and they're like, aren't you glad it didn't come out? You'd be in trouble now. Um, <laughs> and it's true, so because the, the, what the big guy and his friends are saying is they want to reclaim their version of democracy, which is also a whole thing too, about like, we have different versions of democracy now, which on the one hand, I'm glad it's on the table because I think it's been under the surface for a while, but it's scary. And January 6th was, was just totally terrifying. And then on top of it, just to add whatever, I'd written this opera this year that's set in the rotunda of the Capitol. Hmm. Right, exactly. And then, and that was all done. It was opening in March at the Kennedy Center for their 50th anniversary. And I'm like thinking, it's such a conflation in my mind of all of the things I've been playing with. And I'm like, be careful of that statue. You know, yeah. it was so scary. And I grew up there. And by the way, the Capitol Police are like, hi, Bob, let me just get that door for you. I mean, it's not a police force in the way that we mm -hmm. think of police. So that was also terrifying to just realize what they were, you know, what was happening. It was horrible. Is that what you meant? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's open up for 10 minutes of questions. Well, that was a funny answer, but. That's no, I mean, that's part of, part of what satire is. It's, there's, there's a darkness, to your point. Yes. The uh, on-ramp is humor, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. the stop sign of tragedy. Um, the off-ramp off is tears. tears off -ramp. <laughs> any questions? Or concerns? About process, <laughs> about, oh, don't be shy. Yay. Do I miss Brooklyn? Yeah. <laughs> Hells yeah, I miss Brooklyn. This is where they grew the tree. <laughs> but I can't afford anymore. I have a place in Manhattan. I can't afford Brooklyn, though. <laughs> Someday. Did you have a question here? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Gary, you have a Soviet past. And I just wanted, because I'm a Russian writer, and I'm right now it's, I'm a Russian Ukrainian writer, and I feel, how to say, I need maybe some advice <laughs> about, yeah. uh, because I have a good editor and translator, but I still feel, do you feel it's somehow a reflective <coughs> language style? And mm -hmm. what kind of, uh, I just definitely feel I have a little bit different style that I lost in translation, and also I mm -hmm. lost as a, Russian writer, is it a good time to be published? But <laughs> yeah. in immigration stories, I feel very lonely as a writer. Well, of but yeah, Do folks in the back, it. did you hear the question in the back? It's um, hard this to woman is a, is a Russian Ukrainian writer, and she's asking Gary about language and the idea of, of the way she writes and whether things get lost in translation and could and use some advice. How, to, like, how do you help? Because do you feel you have the Soviet soul kind of? Because <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know what you mean. No, no, I've written about that in my books. Um, yeah, and thank you for the question. I, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I think, first of all, obviously, given what's happening in Ukraine, it's very hard not to think about that and to think about what language means there, because in one way, it's one language or one culture trying to enforce itself upon another. Um, two of my grandparents grew up in Ukraine and, and then moved to Russia, so I feel a connection to obviously to both countries, uh, but as this genocide is happening, it almost feels strange to read some of Russian books because so many Russians, even wonderful people like Joseph Brodsky have written horribly anti-Ukrainian things, not to mention Pushkin and, and well, Dostoevsky was just a schmuck overall. Uh, so to separate the brilliance of some of the work from the, these people who were often, not, uh, well, of a very colonialist mindset, I think is very difficult. In terms of writing in English, and, and but being also, yes, yeah, some things do get lost in translation no matter what language you're writing, but I think of it as a, as a help. I think of it as a kind of um, secondary soundtrack that goes through my mind where the language, the Russian language in this case, but it could be any language that you speak, uh, creates for more interesting word, sentence, paragraph structures. So that, because remember, the reader, these are all very good readers, they've read it all. I mean, they, they're sick of the same thing. They want something new. And I think what's so interesting about fiction written from a different perspective is the way language and other things often infuse 
the, the host language, the English language in this case. So I, would, I wouldn't, you know, this is obviously you need a good editor to figure out what's working and what's not working. This is incomprehensible, this is beautiful. Uh, but overall I would say that that's the, that's the important part is to let that language live inside of your English. And, and inside your thoughts. So I have, you know, I, I mean, I, I still have dreams in Russian. Usually I can't get money out of an ATM. You know, <laughs> and I'm screaming, but you know, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Anybody in the back? Hi. Say again. The question yeah. is, how do you write the experience of someone very different than you? That's a very good question, and I think it's it's come up a lot too about whether whether or not one can or should try to take on the experience of others, especially sometimes when people have not had a chance to represent their own experience or been published to be able to represent their own experience. For me, I really number one, I'm, I am inherently not that interesting, so there's no way I would have written 13 books about myself. Um, <laughs> So that's thing one, but I also, I really, it's a desperate attempt to try to understand things beyond my own experience. And so I think a lot about what the writer Grace Paley used to talk to me about, which was writing what is true for the character. So I asked myself, what is organic to this person? What is their socioeconomic history? What has been going on in their life and the world around them until this moment? What brings them here? What do they expect to get out of this story? And I will say there's a weird sort of tweak in my own whatever, existence is that I'm adopted. So I grew up a, a different person in a different family. And I would say that, whatever that does to one's identity or lack thereof, I think also has given me a kind of freedom that maybe some people don't feel. I've talked to a few, I used to talk to Edward Albee about it. Edward, how do you feel about adoption? <laughs> it's not good. You know, um, I'm hostile. I was like, were you born hostile? Um, but anyway, so, you know, I, I really do tr spend a lot of time s with the characters and trying to inhabit them. And the other thing that's really important to me is people always say, am I supposed to like these people? And the truth is, it's irrelevant. Mm. You know, when you look at the books, but Dostoevsky being, you know, whether he was a schmuck or not, you know, well, you don't go like, wow, crime and punishment, I love those people. <laughs> um, can't wait till Thanksgiving. I mean, that's a very modern idea that we have to like the people, or also importantly, that we read just to see ourselves, or to see, it's a, obviously it's important. I would say I never saw who I am reflected in literature. I have yet to, which is very complicated. But we don't read, we, you want to read both to see yourself, but also to see the larger world and to get out of yourselves, which also is why all this banned book stuff right now is so terrifying, because people, you know, it is a door into the, into the much larger world. And if you suddenly go like, well, we're locking that door and we're keeping you right in here, it's really dangerous and scary. Yeah, it's what they call it, the windows and mirrors. Yes. Some books are windows, some books are mirrors. Mm. Yes. And there was a great, was it a Hilary Mantel line the other day that she said, oh yeah, she said something, I look and I think it's a mirror, but then I realize it's a window. Right, okay, never mind. Oh. Um, who, did either of you have a certain kind of reader in mind when you were writing your books? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone will buy the book, really. Yeah. <laughs> I don't discriminate. Well, Everyone's like, yeah. well. Let me follow. Up. Is me there some? Yeah. Is there someone in your crew? You know, some one person's satire might read it and be offended. It oh, might yes. be really, really offensive sure. to them. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious. Has anybody ever come up to you or written to you, especially on social media, and said like, you know what, something you really meant as funny and you really meant as insightful, offended them? Yes. Yeah. All, all People the time. People are offended all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like, yeah. <laughs> We wouldn't be doing our job if people weren't offended. I would have grown up in my was family. There, was there ever one that would surprise yeah, you? Yeah, That really surprised you. And by relatives. Like, got like, oh man. I think it's an important thing because sometimes too I will say, so with this book, a couple of people have said to me, um, you know, I found your book difficult. And I thought, well that, number one, that's not a criticism. That's mm -hmm. actually, okay, you know, since when is it all supposed to not be difficult? But then we talked a little bit more and, and then said, you know, I think some of the things that you meant to be funny aren't funny. And I thought, well, you may have also not read the ones I thought are funny. As you know, it, it could be vice versa. Right. So it's not all funny, and that's okay. And I mean, on the one hand, I certainly, on a personal level, my goal is not to offend people. And people are like, "Oh, you're this transgressive writer. You're just poking at us all the time." I'm like, my goal is to prompt conversation. 
And I think all the more right now, I mean, if you look at the people in this book, I think we need to be talking to them mm -hmm. and we need to be ta able to talk to each other in a way that is not violent and where you can also tolerate that we might really disagree. But fundamentally, I'm not there to hurt you. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like my worst critic will always be my parents. So totally. when you start with that, you kind of don't really care about anyone else. So it's, <laughs> yes. it's my dad be like, oh, good reviews in New York Times, but uh, I looked online and uh, <laughs> totally. Misha from Woodlands says you are finished as a writer. I have. My father used to say, like, I said, oh, something like, you know, they're printing a lot of copies of my books, and they go, really, why? <laughs> and I said, like, you're checking to make sure, and I said, I think they think people read them. And they go, well, they're entitled to their opinion. I mean, it's like, thanks. So it's not, I mean, if you grow up in these houses, yeah. this is all just a blessing afterwards, you know? But if you didn't grow up in these houses, you probably wouldn't have been a writer. You'd be totally, like an no, urban planner or exactly. something helpful. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Who is your tr most trusted reader? before you send it out? I have a couple, four or five people, So, but it, it differ, it, it's different for each book. So when I wrote Lake Success, a bunch of finance bros read it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this book has a character who's Gujarati, and I was not 100%. I have a lot of Gujarati friends. I went to Stuyvesant. Uh, but he read a lot of it to make sure all the Gujarati references were correct, also a Korean-American reader. Huh. Uh, a a non-binary reader because there's a non-binary character. So I try to get together a group of people who really can say, okay, this is not accurate at all. You know, you're just fishing here, um, and and that and that works with different kinds of people mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of uh, ethnic group, etc. But it also works in terms of profession. So SuperSat had a lot of um, technology, so I got all these nerds together, and they. <laughs> showed me what an algorithm was. I had no clue. Uh, and then, um, and sometimes I'll travel for, to a place. So Absurdistan, I had to travel to the Caucasus region, Azerbaijan, Georgia, mm -hmm. and spend a lot of time with those interesting peoples. How about for you, Amdu? I think it changes. You know, it moves all the time. I mean, you know, I would say I always sort of within my apartment, you know. Um, and then I really, it's, again, like I, I got somebody who was sort of like a, um, a national security, per, you know, people, because I also want to make sure this, my, this particular book for me is both much more political, it's also much more historical and factual despite the fiction. So I had to, mm -hmm. you know, check all that. Um, you know, my partner is a good reader, smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, we, as we finish up, um, who do you think pulls off satire well? I Harry. think I thought, <laughs> Thank you. I thought we thought Stephen the Colbert rapport oh. was like just perfect oh. satire, especially when he you know, think about what that was like at the time when he was sending up the Bill O'Reilly kind of care. And he oh, was yeah. so yeah. he was so dedicated to yeah. it. He was dedicated to it. Uh, what's good satire these days? I don't know, because like we were saying, I think everything right. feels like satire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no present left, it's all future stuff. And we're, Trying to make fun of it. It's funny, I also don't, it's, it's like, it's weird to say, I don't think satirically. I'm a very serious person, and mm -hmm. I, you know, but then humor for me is the relief of it. But I don't, I was say, I don't seek humor, although I have been going to comedy clubs, which is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly recommend that. And I did take a bad class as being a stand up comic, which turned out not for me, really. <laughs> did you really? Yeah, I went to UC because, you know, you're alone for years writing these things. So I went and took a class and it, it said something like, I'll get, this is a perfect example. Number one, I didn't realize I qualified for diversity on two fronts. One was being old uh, and the other was being a woman because it's all like young boys. And then they did an exercise where they go, everyone say something about themselves that's true. And one person in the class goes, I don't like it when my dad turns out the light and I'm still reading. And I was like, okay. And then I said, I don't like when I'm in a wheelchair in an airport and people ignore me. Proudly, and, the, and the, the person teaching it goes, it's supposed to be something true. And I go, I don't like it when I'm in a wheelchair in here. When they are, this is like, okay, this is not going to work out. So. Anything you want to tell the audience about your book before we, we wrap up that you haven't gotten to say in any interview oh, anywhere? Book, oh. oh, I wrote it while I was in huge physical pain. Uh, oh, gosh. Yeah, if anyone's written, uh, read my uh, botched circumcision article in the New Yorker, yeah. Look at that. Yes. <laughs> USA. Um, well, please read it. It's very funny, I think, oh for, for such a painful topic. And it's in the New Yorker. Just New Yorker, Steingart. It's excruciatingly funny. It's excruciating. <laughs> but for a while, I, ha I had to be on these drugs that weren't really working, but they I would go to sleep, take the drugs, 
And then I'd wake up and I'd be hallucinating for hours. Like I didn't remember where I was, etc. And then after the hallucinations ended at about 3 p.m., I would write based on those hallucinations. So toward the end of the book, there's some hallucinatory scenes. And that was all provided because of uh, Judaism, I guess. <laughs> no. It was, it was the, the free the, the Soviet jewelry, right? Free that the Soviet jewelry. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I would say two things. One is, you know, I'd say please read it. Um, I think it's interesting to me that it really is, you know, we always think men write the big political social novel, women write the small domestic. As a sort of non-binary person, I tried to do the two together. Try it, I hope you'll like it. The other thing we both want to say to you is there are no books for sale today. But, so, but, <laughs> but Gary has a plan. He's going rogue. I'm going rogue. Uh, if anyone wants to buy and have a book signed, I'm Go to gonna Gary's walk. house. Go to my house, please. Uh, <laughs> Go with me and Anne. Are you going to? Well, there's only three copies over there. Three copies? So I should go. I should go to a different bookstore. No, I'll well, go. We'll go. Uh, Books are magic. Books has, are magic has 28 copies right. and three copies. And, and community bookstore online has books. That's the our, prof our preferred provider mm -hmm. for today. Preferred provider for today. And I love like, them, but, yeah. but just because I wanted to sell some because I like signing things. I know. <laughs> I mean, you know, even napkins or something. So if you want, please just follow us out as we migrate toward Books Are Magic, which I think is on Court Street? Yes. And no, Smith. Smith? Smith. Smith. Sorry. I'm so a Brooklyn person. I, I want to film this. I want to film the footage of Gary. Someone is filming the footage, right actually. Now. There's a documentary oh, about oh. my botch circumcision oh, really? happening. Oh. I kid you not. Really? Is that what this is? That's what that the, is. Are you the circumcision videographer? That's the circumcision wow. videographer. This took a turn. There's this things took I don't want to know. This here. took a turn. This was a good <laughs> end for a satire. And also, on the way out, a producer of our Get Lit with All the Book Club, Jordan, has, we have bookmarks for everybody on the way out Woo. so when you go to buy your books at uh, books are magic take one on your way out let's thank gary and am